Please stand. Love, joy, hope, and peace are yours from our coming King, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for our encouragement today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 through 15. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the good news of God. You may be seated. My dear friends in Christ, I just couldn't believe it. I went out to my mailbox last week Saturday, and there it was. My first Christmas card of the season. Now, some of us may receive those first notes with some added stress, But for others, procrastinators like myself, they provide that that gentle nudge that I need to, to get the communication ball rolling. Because this is the season to communicate, right? We've got Christmas cards and and year end family updates. We've got to coordinate family gatherings and, and gift exchanges. But in the midst of all that busy back and forth, there's one thing that we as Christians want to communicate loud and clear. And that's that the Son of God came into this world, born in a stable, so he could begin his work of saving us from our sin. In these days leading up to Christmas, God opens a door for us to speak of Jesus to our otherwise closed-off culture. And we want to take full advantage of that opportunity. And what better way to prepare ourselves and who better to look to as an example for how to proclaim the coming Savior than that very person whom God used to do that, that thing. The man that we know as John the Baptist. Although the events of our reading took place well after Jesus' birth, it's obvious that Jesus wants us to learn some things about John and his ministry. Specifically, Jesus calls out three main characteristics of of John that God used to make him and still uses to make all of us model gospel messengers. John stood his ground on God's word. He brought his doubts to Jesus and he dared to live differently. Now before we flesh out this theme today, let's just take a step back first and and learn a little bit more about John's life. Earlier today we heard about how John is one of those miracle babies recorded in Scripture. His birth defied all medical logic in that both of his parents were well long in years. His mom was barren. It says something about how desperate things truly were. That 
even while his father, Zechariah, was talking to the angel Gabriel, he said to the angel, nope, it can't happen. It can't be that Elizabeth and I are going to conceive a child. But yet, nothing is impossible for God. And so God, in his mercy, gave Elizabeth and Zechariah that son that they longed for, one who would be dedicated to the Lord even from birth. You see, God had a very special plan in mind for John. He was going to be the forerunner of the Christ. Just like in ancient times, the, the kings would have heralds that would go out in front of them and announce their coming, get people ready. John's job was going to be to be the herald of the king of kings, Emmanuel, God himself come in the flesh to rescue his people. Well, Jesus says that John was no ordinary prophet. At the end of our reading today, Jesus identified him as the Elijah who was to come. Now that's a direct reference to the very last words of the very last book of the Old Testament. The book of Malachi, written some 400 years before Christ, God had promised that he was going to send a prophet, like the great prophet Elijah, who was going to turn the hearts of his people back to him before he came. That was John the Baptist. He is the, the first prophet of the New Testament age. And so, prompted by the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist went out and he, he lived in the wilderness along the Jordan. And there he commanded people to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Huge crowds went out to see John and be baptized by him. Remember, even Jesus himself went. Jesus was baptized in that miraculous event in which John saw heaven being torn open, the Holy Spirit coming down, descending on Jesus from above, the Father speaking, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. But even though John had this high and holy calling as the herald of the Savior, his life was not all smooth sailing. Not by any means. Our reading today begins by saying, when John heard in prison what Christ was doing. Well, what in the world was John the Baptist ever doing in prison? It wasn't because he had broken any laws, nor was he some kind of a criminal. The only reason why he was in prison was because he had stood his ground on the truth of God's word. Jesus asked the crowds a rhetorical question. He said, why did you go out into the desert to see? Did you go out there to see a, a reed swaying back and forth by the wind? No. They all knew that John could hardly be characterized as some kind of a flip-flopper or wishy-washy. No, John told it like it is. He wasn't afraid to call sin, sin, and, and to point sinners to the one way of salvation through God's mercy and forgiveness in the coming Savior. When the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, came to investigate John and his teaching, he called them self-righteous hypocrites and a brood of vipers. When Herod the Tetrarch, that's Herod the great son, began having a public affair with his brother's wife, John called Herod out. He called him to task for his immoral lifestyle, and that is why John was in prison. And eventually, that's the very same thing that would lead to his execution. No, standing on God's word certainly did not make life easy for John. But God, nonetheless, used that message to advance his kingdom because it's through God's word alone that sinful human hearts are changed. And people are brought from the, the darkness of unbelief into the light and freedom of God's grace. My friends, I'm sure that you also are aware that 
standing up for God's word in our secular society isn't going to win you any friends either. More than likely, it's going to get you unfriended and uninvited. You're going to be called backwards, old-fashioned, intolerant, unloving. Corporate policies and advertising campaigns do the best that they possibly can to try to squeeze any mention of Christ right out of Christmas to the point that they would like this whole season to be nothing more than a matter of Yule, Yule logs and good cheer and door busters. But dear Christians, instead of compromising with our culture, let's strive with God's help to confess with our mouths the very same thing that we've been brought to believe in our hearts. That Christ is the most important person of all. And that the most beautiful Christmas paper is not what wraps the presents, but the pages upon which God presents to us the gift of his only Son. But John was not only a bold proclaimer of God's truth. He was also a real human being with real human weaknesses. It seems unimaginable to us at first that that John could have possibly any doubts about who Jesus was. I mean, he'd seen what happened when Jesus was baptized. He'd heard in prison what Jesus was doing. And yet he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come? In other words, are you the Christ? Or should we expect someone else? In order to understand John's question where he's coming from, we do need to remember that by this time, John had been in prison for almost a year. He was locked up simply for standing up for what was right. And it sure didn't seem like Jesus was doing anything about it. I mean, Jesus wasn't going around and and having a petition signed to get John released from jail. He wasn't organizing some secret group to bust John out of prison. But even though John could not understand what God's plan was, what was going on, he did the best thing that any of us possibly can do with our doubts. He brought them to Jesus to have them taken away. My friends, like John, you and I can also be plagued by doubts. Our faith rises and falls in times of testing. We may wonder to ourselves, well, why, Lord? Why are you allowing me to to experience this relationship crisis or or to go through this, this painful health problem? But when those times come, let's not look to our intellect or to our emotions to be our guide. But let's be like John the Baptist and bring our doubts to Jesus. And notice how Jesus reacted. For starters, he did not praise John for his doubts, as if they were some kind of a sign of of spiritual health. I only bring that up because there is a strong undercurrent in popular Christianity today that wants to say that that having doubts are not only a consequence of our natural human sinfulness and weakness, but they're also some kind of a a badge of courage. Like it's it's a good thing if, if I have doubts. Well, my friends, the Bible that I read tells me about a God who is all-powerful, all-loving. A God who is continually asking the doubters like Zechariah and Sarah and Thomas, why? Why did you doubt? Why were you afraid? Because with the God that we have on our side, there's really no reason for it. At the same time, Jesus did not blast John out of the water. He realized that he was a sinful human being. He was patient with John in his weakness. 
Instead, he redirected his attention back to that one place where his doubts could find the answers that he needed and the strength and comfort that he needed. He directed John back to God's word. Jesus replied by by summing up, really, what all the prophets had said the coming Savior would do. He said, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Jesus reassured John that he was exactly who he said he was. He is the Savior, the fulfillment of all the prophets had written. He was performing mighty miracles that only God could do. But most importantly, he was proclaiming that good news of God's full and free salvation. And so, fellow gospel proclaimers, when your life seems upside down, and you wonder, well, what in the world is going on when you are carrying heavy crosses and and, and bothered by doubts? You may want God to just wave a magic wand and, and make everything better. But don't lose sight of the gospel. Because if God were to make your life just right, to fix you up and heal you up, but he didn't do anything to save your soul, what good would it do? But if God makes you and me weak, and that weakness forces us to to go to Jesus, and to hear from him that he is our Savior, to be reminded that he is all that we ever are going to need him to be, well, then God has done us a favor, an eternal favor. Then we are truly blessed. Then we will be strengthened to be God's gospel messenger. The last quality about John that that Jesus brings to the forefront was John's lifestyle. I explained to the children, John definitely was different. Different in his diet, different in his dress, different in where he lived. The guy lived out in the desert. He ate locusts and wild honey. He wore scratchy camel's hair clothes. He had a leather belt wrapped around his waist. John was definitely not red carpet worthy. Now, if we would see John in the news today, it'd probably be on the, the pages of National Enquirer or maybe on TMZ as someone who had just gone off their rocker according to what the world would say. But God made John different for a reason. So that by his unusual lifestyle, people would be drawn to his unusual message, a message that came straight from heaven. That's a message that Pastor Janish will elaborate on next week. In the meantime, God has not called you or me to to empty our wardrobes and, and go out and live off the land. But he has called us to live differently. By baptism and faith, we are witnesses of Christ just like John was. As I said before, what better time than now to let that difference show. So then, how can we stand out in our unbelieving world this Christmas Eve? Well, I can think of a, a couple of different practical ways. In this time of year in which there are parties aplenty, in which we're tempted to overindulge in, in eating and drinking, we can ask our God to give us a a special measure of of self-restraint so that we can go to such occasions with our ears open to hear the the needs and the troubles of our friends and family and, and apply the healing of God's truth and the comfort that we have found in our Savior Jesus. Earlier this week, I, I sent out an email to the congregation that 
I've talked about this devotional series, Peace for the Broken. It's an Advent series that goes from today all the way until actually the Epiphany, January 6th. It has daily devotions. They take about five or, or ten minutes to complete. But through those, I pray that, that God may provide our families with a pathway for bringing Christ into our homes, for making worship of Him the, the center point of our families, and, and for parents to be able to, to take the lead in spiritual matters as God has called us to do for our children. And while our world is running here and there, running on the empty fumes of catchphrases, devotions like these and, and coming to worship and being fueled with God's word can build us up, fill us up with God's love and peace and power. So that then God's kingdom will powerfully advance. In our day, just as it did in John. But God's kingdom is not one that is outwardly impressive, one of, of self-glorification. No, it is a kingdom of humility and self-denial in which God has called us to be his gospel messengers who stand on the truth of God's word, who bring our doubts to our Lord, and who show our Christian faith by how we live. Amen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all ages.